The January 6th hearings are taking place 50 years after the Watergate break-in and underscore a contrast between the Republican reaction to the eventual evidence of a conspiracy back then and now. Polling shows that many Republicans still believe the Trump big lie and are discounting the facts presented by the committee. Robert Draper took a deeper look at the comparisons between the eventual Watergate hearings and the January 6th hearings in The New York Times this weekend and joins us now. So your story, Robert, and I'm so glad you're here to talk about it. It centers on a recent meeting of the alumni of the Watergate investigation, a gathering Friday night on the actual 50th anniversary of the burglary, and their comparisons then and now. Right, right. I mean, the basic comparison, I think the most salient one, Andrea, was that back then the truth wasn't up for debate. I mean, plenty of Republicans sided with Nixon. Most of them did. But when the facts dictated otherwise, my grandfather, by the way, the Watergate special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, accepted the job under the belief that Nixon was innocent. He figured it was just overzealous White House aides who did it. Then he listened to the tapes. The tapes changed his mind. Uh, facts mattered back then. And your grandfather, I mean, you were a teenager, so you talked to your grandfather in real time about this right. during the Watergate. He took over from Archibald Cox after the Saturday Night Massacre. Right. And it was he who brought those cases. Yes, yes. There were more than 40 prosecutions. And he did so after listening to some of the tapes that had already been released when he heard Nixon talk to White House aides, uh, 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 suggesting that they try to secure hush money payments for Watergate uh, defendants, burglary defendants, uh, suggesting that they say, I don't recall, I don't know, essentially telling them to lie. And my grandfather, who really was, you know, a creature of the law, was shocked to hear Nixon, himself a lawyer, uh, say those kinds of things and became radicalized as a result of that. Now, uh, refresh my memory because I don't recall in his memoir, how did he feel about the pardon? Well, he was of the belief, my grandfather was, that, that Nixon probably could not have received a fair trial. He believed that it was constitutionally appropriate for President Ford to issue the pardon. So he set, sent signals, in fact, uh, preemptively to the Ford White House that he, uh, the special prosecutor, wouldn't challenge uh, the pardon. I, I don't think, though, that he—I I think he really expected, Jaworski did, that uh, uh, that Nixon would fade into ignominy. You know, that, that he didn't imagine that he would be this trusted advisor to other Republicans, that he'd have a best-selling memoir. Uh, my grandfather didn't live long enough to see all of that, but I think he would have been surprised and dispirited by them. And just a footnote there, because I got to know President Ford rather well, and uh, when he received the JFK Profile and Courage Award for the pardon from Caroline Kennedy, he said to me and others who were with him that night that that was the proudest of he had ever been. Because, of course, that largely contributed greatly to his defeat. Of it, course, it did, it was so but I, he was, I'm sure that what he meant by that, Andrew, was that he felt that the country had been hopelessly fractured as a result of Watergate, and it was an attempt on President Ford's part to bring the country back together, even at electoral cost. Uh, let me uh, ask you about the comparison, because Richard Nixon in 1960 could have challenged his loss right. to... John F. Kennedy, there were, there were very substantive reasons to think there had been some fraud. Sure. Did not. He certified on January 6th as the sitting vice president that loss. So he was criminal behavior, yes. You know, he resigned in disgrace, the only president to do that. But he was a... a an institutionalist, shall we say? Yeah, I, I think I think that's well put, Andrew. Because I, uh, uh, it is true that on the front end, he and his White House fellows and campaign aides tried illegally to game an election, but he didn't try to overthrow the election results. Uh, when he uh, when he saw that uh, uh, the way the votes were going to swing against him, the Republicans, that is, after the damning tapes finally came out, um, he resigned, and he resigned, I think, for the good of the country. When uh, President Trump almost certainly would have fought it all the way to the bitter end. And the other very interesting comparison is that it was Hugh Scott, a leading Republican, a minority leader in the in the Senate, and Barry Goldwater, another leading Republican and former nominee, who went to him and said, "You have to resign. You've lost them." You know, right. and it was also Republicans voting. You know, Bill Cohen voting on the Senate on the House Judiciary Committee. Right. And they, and they didn't do it because they got sick of Nixon. They did it because they followed the facts. They, they recognized that the public did as well. And they thought that it was untenable for him to stay on. Robert Draper, thank you so very much.